first I can introduce myself because we've got a couple couple new folks. Welcome. Um, and of course, those watching on recording. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong. And welcome to Break Club. So today we will be doing our monthly Brain Club book chat. Today will be about the book, Sincerely, Your Autistic Child, which I'll tell you more about after we go through our community agreement. Um, first, um, if you're new to Brain Club, what is Brain Club? This is our weekly community education program with the purpose of providing education about All Brains Belong's approach to neuro-inclusive community culture it's with the idea that then um, you go out into the world um, and spread new ways of thinking and being, and that that is how systems change happens. We hope that what you'll experience is a place to feel safe, a place to experience how culture can be different, um, and a place where you and we together collectively learn and unlearn. Um, Sarah and Lizzie, would you be able to take over letting people in from the waiting room, please? It's hard to do that while I'm in share screen. Yeah, I've been letting people in. Oh, okay. All right. Um, though All Brains Belong has many different types of programs that do many different things, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group or a place to make individualized requests or address individualized needs. We're really staying at the 50,000 foot level, exploring big picture themes and topics, and we invite you to share ideas or reflections related to the, the general themes. All paths to participation are welcome here. You can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still um, or look at the camera or any of those other neuronormative constructs. Please feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or anything else that needs doing. Um, you also uh, don't, don't need to interact. Observation is a completely valid form of participation. Um, you can interact. I uh, will go through use of the chat in a second. Um, you can ask questions, you can make comments in the chat as we go, and everyone is welcome. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, what we do to try to make this safe for all participants is we prioritize the group's needs over that of the individual. So we're very careful about language used, and we're thinking about the group's collective access needs access needs. What are those? Um, that's anything that is required for full and meaningful participation. Um, everyone with all types of brains has access needs. It's just that um, depending on what types of environments you're in, um, you may be more or less likely to have your access needs met by what's going on in the environment. Here's all different types of access needs. So some of the ones we like to bring up up front Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot, 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 and choose show subtitles or show captions. You can also do the same to turn them off if you want to turn them off. That's my visual support to make sure I have the chat um, open. Um, oh, hello, Mariah. Welcome. So speaking of the chat, um, you are welcome to use the chat um, to validate other people's comments or share something about how you're impacted by something you're hearing. Um, you can also ask questions that our staff will answer. We just ask that if you're going to use the chat, and again, it's completely optional. If you just want to have nothing to do with the chat, that's completely fine. But if we just ask that you use the like the big box, the regular chat box, instead of the replies or the threads, um, just because of the uh, access needs um, of, of many of our facilitators, many of our staff, it's very hard when the chat is bouncing and we will... Um, more, we're more likely to miss your questions and miss your comments if the chat is bouncing. So we just ask that you type in the big box instead. Um, we also have cadence here um, for tech support. So if you are having a tech problem or a tech question or anything having to do with tech, you can send a direct message directly to cadence, tech support, ABB, cadence, um, and uh, cadence can help you out. This way we're keeping tech stuff out of the chat um, uh, because tech stuff can be, can be overwhelming and we want to make sure you get what you need. 
Awesome. Hi, Cadence. All right. Um, before we get started, just want to uh, preview next month at Brain Clubs. So every month we have a new theme. So next month is learning and unlearning, which of course we're always doing at Brain Club, but we're going to we're going to call the theme that um, and uh, lots, lots of things to learn and unlearn next month and always. All right. So here we go. Um, and I want to move my screen. There we go. So um, this book, I really have to say, is one of the most powerful books I have read in a really long time. So Sincerely Your Autistic Child, um, edited by Emily Page Ballou, Sharon Davaport, and Marina K. Giwa Anawu, um, is a collection of essays written by autistic adults. I want to read um, a passage from the editors. As you read different chapters in this book, please keep in mind that each writer has offered to share a part of who they are as a person so that you may better understand what autistic people experience as we navigate the world. Um, and the story of this book, there was an there was an initial version um, published by the Autistic Women's Network, um, which has since become the Autistic Women's and Non-Binary Network. So it was initially written um, from the experience of um, autistic women. Um, this current edition was um, uh, expanded upon to be representing a much broader range of experiences, looking at intersectional aspects of identity, um, looking at um, all different types of genders, including authors who are trans and non-binary. And um, really it is, um, I'll, I'll read, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna uh, read some excerpts from this book. And we will, I think what you'll see is that there are some commonalities of experience, maybe that are similar or different to your own or to people in your lives um, and, and some differences. And I think as we talk about at Brain Club all the time, when we think about the intersectional aspect of all different parts of identity, um, that is going to have a different um, experience. Before we begin, I do want to give a content warning for this, the rest of Brain Club. Um, you will hear descriptions of distress. Um, we're not going to have any details of traumatic events, but there are references to trauma generically. There are also references to um, behavioral compliance modalities, including um, applied behavioral analysis and um, uh, several references to ableism. So the structure of the book is that it's divided into three sections, early memories, childhood, and education, acceptance and adaptation, and intersectional identity and finding community. So we'll begin with early memories. This excerpt I'll read, and the slide won't have all the words. There's too many words to put on the screen. Um, so this comes, this chapter, this essay is called Acknowledge Vulnerability, Presume Competence by B. Martin Allen. Expectation. I can feel your resentment. If I am not the child you wanted, if you feel your life has been made unfairly difficult, I feel that. If you love me, but you wish, that wish is a barrier too. It serves as a roadblock to your love. I may not be capable of toughening up, exposing me to sensory onslaught only drains my reserves. I will not develop an immunity to sensory or emotional pain simply by prolonged exposure, even if that exposure is called therapy. I need safe spaces. 
I will be better equipped to take risks and test my limits if I know there is a real safety net under me. Turn the page. So this comes from an essay by Kasian Asasumasu, who is the person who actually coined the term neurodivergent. Most overarchingly, know that our self-esteem is fragile. No one likes being exasperating, and we know we are perceived that way. Most children want to please adults and want other children to like or at least not hate them. Autistic children are still children, and this pattern holds for us. We were plopped into a world where everyone and everything tells us we're wrong for completely incomprehensible reasons. This gets exhausting very quickly, and it breaks down faster than you can imagine. We learn very early on that what we are isn't what you wanted when you became a parent. You can readjust your dreams, hopes, and expectations, and you can love us fiercely, but we know we're not what you really desired. Please don't tell your child that she's all you ever dreamed of in one moment and then send her to hours of coercive, damaging therapy meant to change who she is in the next. These do not add up. We know these do not add up. This passage from Katie Levin in What I Wish You Knew. I wish my parents knew that when I was refusing to do something, it was often because I was overwhelmed and I wasn't given the right kind of support. My parents often told me I needed to learn to, quote, get over it. And if I didn't, I'd never be able to function in life, college, on the job, with a boyfriend, etc. I wish I could have grown up in an environment where I wasn't constantly treated like I was broken. I felt like I wasn't okay unless I learned to act like everyone else. So this one from Heidi Wangelin. What I wish my parents knew about being their autistic daughter. Water has also been a constant source of both sensory input and comfort since it felt good to have a splash across my face and legs. If I had my way, I'd always be in water. Water and a piece of paper won't let you down like people do. And you can always erase the paper somehow. You can't erase people from your life as easily. Loneliness was the hardest part of growing up, more than any bullying ever was. Looking back as I write this, in my new apartment with my little desk all messed up and staring out into the tree planter, I think much of my loneliness was self-imposed because I often thought that most people didn't like me. I knew my parents loved me and that my teachers liked me, but I honestly believed that people my own age disliked me. I often felt like I was losing control of myself, like I didn't know who I was.
I think in pictures and sounds like a camera. So it was like having a rush of feelings and pictures coming straight into my eyes and brain. And I couldn't find the words to describe it. At times, it is like a camera that I can't control, though. Certain things will set off my camera. And I can't process feelings when this happens. I really hate picking up others' feelings because they become my own. Feelings can be overpowering for me, too, as an empathic person. I can't block them out even if I try. If someone is hurting, for me, it is overpowering. It feels like being stabbed in the gut. Or if someone is happy, I can feel it too. I can also sense feelings of anger and sadness easily, even if other people can't. I can't read body language well, but I can feel things very strongly. This one comes from Karen Lean, a particular way of being. As a child, I learned that my body and my boundaries were wrong. I learned that my discomfort couldn't possibly be real because my discomfort was uncommon. For example, if my parents put me in a shirt that had a rough tag, I learned that if I cried, no one would understand that the clothing hurt me. I felt dismissed when I talked about it, and I was a compliant child, so I didn't take off the offending item. I learned to put up with extreme bodily discomfort. Relent to pain often enough, and it doesn't become less painful. It becomes a lesson that the pain didn't matter. I started to distrust my own body. So common. The pain doesn't disappear into the background. It interferes with being curious and present in the world. Sensory pain is distracting. I pay less attention to social cues and my senses are overburdened. This kind of overburdening affects my social perception and communication. When I wear a comfortable outfit to work, I focus better. I think more clearly. I'm more effective with people. So take the distractions and discomforts of your child's body seriously and help them address the worst offenders creatively. One of the most powerful tools you can give her is to control her environment, her attention, and her physical comfort. I hid my struggles by focusing exclusively on what I did well, and I did myself a disservice in the process. People assume that I do not have challenges in some areas because I am competent in others. Just because I can write a successful grant proposal doesn't mean I can navigate a crowded club to stay safe. Just because I can explain how matrilineal descent works doesn't mean I can figure out how to order from the restaurant menu. I learned that people won't believe me when I say I need help, so I stopped asking. Okay, so the second section of this book, Acceptance and Adaptation. This one comes from Haley Moss. I hope you have the type of child who will live their life fearlessly, unafraid of the world ahead, and brave enough to use their words or experiences to show that autism is not something to be ashamed of, embarrassed about, 
or an inner demon. And to raise a child like that, one who is so confident in their own skin, begins with you. This one comes from an essay called Unconventional by Amethyst Schaber. Differences can be a profound source of discomfort between people. When the person in question is your own child, that discomfort can hurt your child. If loving effort is not made to accept what is different, those differences become chasms and disapproval of someone's true self burns bridges faster than we can build them. Children are their own people and will grow up to want and not want things for themselves that their parents didn't expect. And when it comes to autistic children of non-autistic parents, this is especially true. As a parent, you likely have a dream for your child's life, a wish list of all the good things you expect. You have to be careful with expectations. This one comes from Lee Wiley Meitsky, essay called Change the World, Not Your Child. They give advice to parents for how to be supportive. No one expects one person to change the entire world. What you can do is change your world. Mel Baggs writes in their essay, 10 Things I Wish My Parents Had Known When I Was Growing Up. You may not know she has high support needs until she is in a situation where she can't function. The more skills I had to manage on my own, the less energy I had to put into other skills and the more behind I got. This had been going on since early adolescence, but it really picked up pace when I moved out on my own. I think they are telling the story of, of autistic burnout. Or this one from the author H.W. The essay called The View from Outside My Window. Ableism is as real as racism and sexism, but it is a kind of discrimination that sneaks up behind you. And somehow people view it as acceptable, like cigarette smoke snaking around you or some colorless gas. It is seductive in the way that it works. It is appealing, but toxic, and it can kill you internally. It can lead to horrible external things. Words are powerful, so please don't use discriminatory words. Please don't add to the exchange of ableism. For me, self-acceptance was similar to a feeling that one of my queer friends described about coming to terms with their sexuality. My friend said that instead of feeling like they were being forced, quote, out of a closet into the open without any help, it felt more like a change in perspective. It's like, like an airplane rises off the ground, like going from seeing only your small world into thinking that every part of the world is exactly like yours until you leave your little corner. Leaving the tarmac, the plane starts soaring and you look down from the window to see how tiny your little world is. And that's what self-acceptance seemed like for me. It was that kind of cathartic relief, realizing that my view from before was so limited and now being able to realize what life could be like.
another quote from Mel Bagge. I'm giving advice to parents and caregivers and helping professionals. Think about what's important. There are lots of things that I am not likely to ever learn how to do, or if I learn how to do them, my movement disorders will prevent me from applying that knowledge. So if I'm going to put in the extreme effort it takes for me to learn and sustain a skill, it had better be a skill that makes me happier, like crocheting, not just a skill that makes things easier on everyone else, like making my bed. This one from Lynn Soraya, Self-Acceptance and Hope. I grew up without a diagnosis, facing a lot of confusion and pain because I didn't understand my own neurology. I didn't understand why some things were so painful for me. I didn't understand why people could do things that I couldn't. That ignorance had really painful consequences, leading me to believe that there was something deeply, deeply wrong with me. I lived with self-hatred for years. Yet, even with those consequences, there are times that I think I was better off not knowing. Why is that? Well, when I hear the things that parents and children are told today, I wonder what that would have meant for the life I live today. This is something I had to navigate my way through when I first learned I was on the spectrum, now almost 15 years ago. The people who knew me, the people I worked with, might have thought I was eccentric or odd, but I don't know that they would have made the connection to autism. But I had learned at that point how to mask my challenges, my anxieties, my fears so well that even my husband and family didn't really know they existed. I'd learned how to pass, but at a great cost to myself. The unfortunate fact of passing is that you can never be sure the people who claim to like you really do. If they could see you as you really are, when all the barriers go down and you just don't have the energy to pretend anymore, would they still like what they saw? That was the reality I lived with every day. And the fact that people did like the false self that I presented seemed to underscore the deep insecurities and self-hatred that I'd learned to feel. It seemed that they liked the false me better than the real me. You go on to say, even when I didn't have a diagnosis, believing that autistic traits are bad while the rest of you is good makes it more difficult to deal with the challenges those traits may present in a social environment than if you're able to accept them and see them clearly for what they are. I still picked up the negative messages that the world had about autism and the traits that define it. I picked it up through teasing and implicit judgments the subtle rejections that happened every day, the friends who began avoiding me or stopped calling me to come over to play, the teachers who jumped to conclusions about my behavior. How much easier is it to come to the conclusion that you are broken, lesser than when you are faced with these messages every day? One we don't have a slide about, but I like this one. Fighting who you are is often futile. 
And the result is you spend so much time fighting what you don't like that you don't focus on the skills and abilities that you have in abundance. Okay, and then the last section, intersectional identity and finding community. This is an anonymous essay called Tell Me I'm Autistic. As a child, I was painfully aware that there was something wrong with me. So while growing up, I worked diligently to hide my thoughts and feelings and the confusion that was ever present. I would sit in my room filled with guilt and anger and shame because I had no idea what I had done correctly or incorrectly at school that day. I wasn't able to take away from each interaction whether or not it had been successful. And then I would spend the rest of the evening wondering what I would do wrong the next day. At school, every day, I would return home, go to my room, lock the door, and berate myself for whatever had occurred at school that day. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't nice enough. Had I spoken inappropriately, I had difficulty knowing what to say and what not to say. Had I hurt anyone's feelings? Had I done anything wrong? Had people been laughing at me or with me? Had I broken any rules? So what is it that I wish parents knew about autistic children? That we need to know we are autistic. This comes from an essay by Lydia X.C. Brown on surviving loneliness and isolation and learning to live with loss. I can't remember a time when I felt like I truly belonged anywhere. In years of talking to other autistic people, hundreds of other autistic people, this sense of constant alienation, isolation, separation, and loneliness turns out to be incredibly common. I have survived trauma after trauma throughout my life. Some of that trauma is what we call ordinary trauma, things that might seem small or minor to people outside our lives, but that nonetheless affects us profoundly. Much of the trauma I've experienced both in childhood and, and adulthood has been connected to isolation and the loss of friends. Social ostracism and shunning are dangerous and deeply violent. Whether done within a family unit, in school, in a religious cult, or in an identity-based community. And then they go on um, directing this to their parents. I don't think you could have predicted that, but I wish you had known just how much it hurt to be told that I had friends and people who loved me. Because in moments when I was grieving, in the loss of friends, or the realization that the people I thought were friends were actually bullies, what I actually needed to hear was simply an affirmation that what I was experiencing was awful, that sometimes people are terrible, that sometimes it's not meant to work out, that sometimes life brings awful bitterness and sorrow and only correct reaction, and the only correct reactions are grief and rage. Even today, I still gravitate toward loners. Anywhere I go, I have an intuitive sense for the weird and lonely people often other disabled, sick, mad, neurodivergent, queer, and trans people. We witness each other. We know each other. We can recognize other people who share this pain. 
the pain of constant rejection and fear of rejection, the pain of trying our damnedest to be kind and decent people, only to be exploited and betrayed over and over again, often with little or no explanation. I wish you'd taught me better how to set and enforce boundaries for myself, for my time, my energy, my space, my life, and my love. You wanted me to be safe. Most parents want this for their children. I would give anything for my younger self to have been able to feel both safe and free at the same time. This one comes from Emily Page Ballou in an essay called There's a Place. I want you to know that your child's finding her place in the world doesn't depend on how well she pretends to be what other people want or expect her to be, but on finding the places where other people are most okay with who she actually is. So there we have it. I'm gonna try to scroll through the chat in reverse order. Um, Sarah says, um, I think about PDA kids and adults as canaries in the coal mine, naming all the things. And that can be unsettling to so many people, especially adults who are not used to that dynamic. I don't think there's anything odd about it. I think it's beautiful and unfortunately often misunderstood. Yep. So lots of people, looks like there a lot, a lot of what you heard you're resonating with. Um, love, love to hear from others. Um, if anything that stood out, stood out to you or what it was like to hear some of those things. Michelle. What Lydia X Z Brown had said about being nice to people and having them exploit you and, and, you know, and no explanation that just, it's like every single friendship of my life. I just totally relate to that. And, and only recently I've started to understand about narcissism and narcissistic abuse from, you know, like Dr. Romani Dursavala and, it seems like we are magnets to the narcissist and they always come to us because we are maybe desperate for friendship because of how we were treating our whole lives that we, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll take whatever comes to us. And it's surprising when someone approaches us for friendship, you know, because it's usually us trying to make bids for friendship and being rejected. So if somebody approaches us for friendship, you know, it's like, oh, wow, you know, and it's so easy to get really sucked into that kind of a relationship and then you realize that they yeah. are just like after you for whatever narcissistic supply they're getting well, out of you michelle i just want to redirect you a little bit um just the 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 um there are many people who because of trauma in their lives have had um a, a transformation toward narcissism but they don't abuse and they don't have behavior so i just don't want to over i don't want to like um uh characterize Okay, um, sorry. Narcissism. No, no apology necessary. I just wanted to wanted to redirect. We're just talking about harm, right? Being harmed by other people, being exploited by other people. Um, okay. and yes, I think it's it's all too it's all too common. Um, uh, that um, and especially um, uh, you know, when 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 we think about um, 
people who are porous to energy, taking all of this in, there's therefore energy to, you know, to, to drain, right. It's, 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 it's really hard. And I, I agree that that pattern, um, that pattern is really common. Thanks for sharing, Michelle. Sierra. Yeah. I think on a similar note to what you were talking about, Michelle, I think one of the parts of the book that I really resonate with, and I hear a lot is that idea of, you know, if I'm, um, masking all the time and all my relationships are based on my masked version of myself. Do people really like me or do they like this different version of me that I'm putting on? Um, and I think that really comes into play when we're going through the process of unmasking and often people do lose, you know, relationships and friendships in that process. Um, but the joy of being able to build up relationships and friendships of people who really identify and really go with your true self is a really cool thing. Um, and, you know, seeing, seeing that light on the other side of it, I guess. Yeah. And it's, and I think Sierra, it's not, um, for many people, it's not like an all, like a linear progression of like, now I've reached it. Now I, and it's, it's all, it, it, it really, I think it comes from safety, right? So when you are in, if in environments where your access needs are met, where you're around safe people, um, who do interact with you in a way that makes you feel good about yourself. Like some people have never had that happen. And so you don't, you're not able to discern safe from not safe because you've never, you've never felt that way around other people. Just going to read a couple of comments in the chat. Um, sorry, my, how do I make it bigger? Here we go. Um, it keeps moving. Sorry. Um, Martha says um, uh, that, um, says I've had that experience in the past. I used to do volunteer work in hopes of making social connection. People would thank me for my work and then have no interest in being real friends. Just Martha, you're so good at this. Can you do it again? Yeah, it can be really, really, really hard when um, people don't have the same goals in a relationship. And that can be really, really, hurt, really hurtful. And I think um, um, it's high saying something that really reminded me of what Michelle said um, uh, when when we're at this place where self-esteem is such because of a lifetime of of of, of everything you just heard, um, being grateful that we think someone loves us. Yeah. Jenna sharing, um, new to the diagnosis, um, hearing the excerpts read was hard. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Jenna. I, 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 I cried through reading most of that book. Kathleen says, uh, the constant self-evaluations at the end of the day and ruminating way into the night really resonated. Did I prove my worthiness by being helpful, talented, hardworking enough? Oh, so common. So common. And Ariana says, and then the lines between me and my mask blur and get confusing even to me. Like, who am I even without it? Yeah, absolutely. Kathleen says, uh, plus all the social interaction mysteries. Yeah, I think many people describe something like, well, you know, I didn't get the book that tells you all the social rules, like as though um, in 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 some in, in some other people would say, like, there are people who don't think about there being social rules. They just are. Right. And 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 so it's it's not like there's a book and I didn't get it. It's just that I have the kind of brain that actually derive safety from predictable systems. I really want there to be predictable rules of how humans interact. I want them to make sense and be based on something that is sensical. They're not. Yeah. Since I was always looking for that book, Barnes and Noble. Funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Monique says, I relate very much to the author who wrote about having the reality of their physical sensations gaslit. Definitely. So, so the author wrote about the tag. It's, you know, well, it, it's, it's loud in here. It's not loud. It's hot in here. It's not hot. Like, oh, I guess I'm the kind of person who doesn't even know whether I'm hot or not, or that it's loud or not, or it's bright or not. Like how, 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 how could it not follow to then lose trust, you know, the brain body disconnect, lose, lose connection with your internal body signals. How could that not happen?
Liz is sharing, congratulations on your diagnosis. And it is hard. I've grieved so much since my suspicions, then my diagnosis. I'm finding that around every six months, I have a shift, big shift in understanding. And that's what's helping me to continue to move forward. Yeah, I think that um, there's lots of emotions and it's not, it's, 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 you could, it's, you can have so many emotions at the same time. And I think that, you know, the, 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 for many people, it's cycles of like, you know, not, not just relief and I'm so glad I have this, but, you know, rage and anger and resentment and sorrow and what, what, what would things have been like had I known sooner? Like all of those things, those are really complex emotions, but it is part of the journey of, of, of discovering oneself. And I think that, for many people, um, they'd say that that being part of a community of other people navigating similar journeys um, and reflections and hearing your stories reflected back to you, whether it's something you read or you see on social media or hear somebody say, it's that's part of it. Yeah, Michelle, I've been called a drama queen my whole life. That resonates with me for sure. Would anyone else like to share? Jenna says... Um, even that's a new concept. The I, the uh, that others have experienced things that I've experienced but not shared. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. I remember shortly after my ADHD and autism diagnoses, um, like seeing on social media, like what? How does a perfect stranger articulate my innermost experiences with such great precision that I never had words for? Monique. Hi, Mel. <laughs> and hi, everyone. Um, what a really nice surprise this book was. I thought it was a book written by children, which I totally would listen to because I read children's books <laughs> a lot and often. And, um, but just to hear the perspective of adults looking back and writing notes to their parents on how things could have perhaps been different and hopefully better. I mean, I think I'm going to write a note myself. I think I'm going to write a note to, I'm going to write a note to my teacher who was really supportive, who recognized something and created an environment for me to feel comfortable. Um, I'm going to write a note to the teachers who didn't really understand <laughs> you know right I can write lots of notes I think this is going to be the beginning of some sort of revolution but <laughs> I'm really excited to listen to the book I've I've got the audio version which is accessible to me and I'm looking forward to listening to that because I am I have been going over memories of childhood and going and and realizing now it makes sense. Okay, I have a better understanding. I have a whole lot less judgment. I have grief. Like these are all things that is, I think I, I've heard echoed by many adults who, many people who receive an adult diagnosis, just this new understanding. And then the reframing of my history is, um, it's rich. There's a lot there. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of emotion and a lot of narrative. And um, yeah, I like what Sarah just said about a new framework. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for letting me share. I appreciate the space. Well, I really appreciate you sharing. And um, you know what a what a a, a, a powerful statement to. Um, that you're making these connections that like you writing your own letters um inspired by this i think that's i i think that's absolutely amazing um and i think that um what 
what um, Sierra also shared about the, the power of adopting a new framework is it's like, well, looking backwards, I wasn't a broken, defective, neurotypical person, right? Like I, that, um, this, the, the way my brain is, the way I experience the world, the way I communicate, the way that I, I think and learn, like it's always been this way. I just didn't know. And because so many people, um, you know, grow up with the message that there is one correct way to think, communicate, play, like there's one correct way to play, like play is the pursuit of joy. Like you don't get to decide what somebody's play is. Um, but if you get that message that, that one size fits all and there's one lane to go down and you're not doing it, you're broken. Like that's, that's profoundly harmful. Um, and so to be able to rewrite that and like that core belief is so important, Sierra. I think that also really just kind of shuts off um, for a lot of us, our ability to engage in things. I think of like, you know, having the experience of being at social gatherings that weren't a good fit for my access needs and thinking, oh, I just don't like socializing. I just don't like interacting with people. When really it was just, I just didn't have experience going to a, a social gathering or inter interaction that fit my needs. And so when you are able to see that new framework and open that up, you have access to things that you might have just not had access to before because you didn't realize there was another way to do it. So well said. Absolutely. Um, reading Liz's comment in the chat and then Michelle next. Um, Liz says, I do worry that as a parent, I am telegraphing that they are a lot for me. Um, uh, but I come back to working on the trust relationship, um, uh, calling myself out and repairing, trying to model unconditional love and expose shame. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, as, as the autistic parent of an autistic child, I think that um, my experience is that the things that most remind me of the things that I was shamed for as a child, those are the things that are most triggering to me um, that require so much like preparation ahead of time to cope with. So like, thank you for, thank you for naming that Liz. Michelle and then Naomi. Thank you, Dr. Mill. Um, it's just a coincidence that my comment is following up on my parents' comments, so don't take it personally. But um, when you guys were talking about the messages that you pick up from around you, I was told directly from my mother that there was something wrong with me. You know, and I mean, she had me when she was 30 and I'm the last of seven. So like the child rearing practices have changed a lot since then. You know, it's it's now more child centric and stuff. But back then, for those of us who are older autistic adults, we we probably had some of the worst um, parenting philosophies when when we grew up that really did make us know that we were defective because we were actually told that and we were defined as that by our, our own parents. So I think thousand parents nowadays. Congratulations for being more woke about all this stuff. And you're doing a good job. You're doing a hell of a lot, lot job, better job than we had for us. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Naomi and then Sarah. Hi, sorry I arrived late and really glad that you are recording this. Um, I really struggle with executive functioning in a way that I didn't earlier in my life. And despite that, I, I just started meeting with Brattleboro TV to create a autistic neurodiversity series. And I'm looking for people who might want to be interviewed for the series, or I'm looking for topics that people think that uh, for, for allies, as well as for people coming out autistic at midlife, like What's the show that you wish you had heard? And also um, if there's podcasts or other resources or books, I just want to, um, I want to build a program and I'm really yeah, flooded in a program. Yeah. Thanks, Naomi. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, I'd recommend reaching out to communities on social media about that. 
Um, Auburn's yeah. Belong has a, a social media channel, for example. Um, yeah, we try to tr we, we 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 really try to use being as um, community education and not not um, uh, directly um, soliciting uh, participation for programs. But you're welcome to connect on social media. Right. I apologize, Mel. Uh, I, I no, that's a, that's okay, Naomi. That, that, that's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to Sarah. Thanks for waiting, Sarah. Yeah. So, um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I guess I think about, uh, or one of the things that is occurring to me as we're just as we're talking, and, and I, I'm not sure if I believe it or not, but, um, I think I often find myself, you know, sort of with with this question, you know, going going sort of to search the 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 possibilities that are out there, the, and my question is usually like. Why do I feel disconnected and alienated and like my life isn't working and you know frustrated? You know, why what's what's wrong with me or what's wrong with something um that you know and and then and and so then I and then I come across a book like the one we read today and I go, oh that have the I know why. It's because I was I'm autistic. And and I and I and I think there's I I think that's a mistake to uh, I, I and um and I, I think there's a useful distinction to make that I'm starting to make and one of the distinction I'm starting to make is I feel disconnected and alienated because I live in a disconnected alienating culture like it's it's like no matter what I do if whether I was on the good side of the culture or the bad side of the culture I'd feel disconnected and alienated that's the nature of my culture it's disconnecting and alienating you know, that's the way our culture <laughs> operates. That's what everybody gets. You know, it isn't any better. You know, that's business as usual for the culture at large. But when I then I go out and reach out and I find a book like this today and I go, oh, but here's a possible group of people I could connect with where I could feel less disconnected and less alienated because maybe these people aren't disconnected and alienating. Maybe these people are doing something different than the culture I live in. And so I just think that that's an important distinction to make. Anyway. Yes, all of that. All of that. Yes. And like, I think that is um, just even the fact that like when you, when you meet someone or you read something and you're like, oh, I can, like, this culture feels different. This culture feels safe, as opposed to, like, almost everywhere else. So, um, and I think this reminds me to, um, I, it was Liz or Sarah talking about, about the, the canary in the coal mine, of, like, it, you're not wrong when you feel disconnected and alienated from an unsafe culture. Right, that's mm -hmm. your limbic system sounding the alarm to say this is not safe. This is not good for me. Exactly. It's not good for anybody, really. Like so, so there's that. So anyway, with that, I really appreciate all of you being here, um, being part of reimagining something different. Um, and we look forward to to seeing you next week. Um, we'll kick off our uh, August Brain Club, learning and unlearning. Bye, everybody.